Thank you. Yeah, boy, this is beautiful. Mm. I was when we were singing. I because this, as I was saying last night, and we've been saying for two days, like this is a movement that's occurring here. That's what this is. The enemy doesn't want you to know what's really happening in your life. That's one of the. I said last night, deception and accusation are the only weapons the enemy has against you. And and we were talking about our, our team was talking about this this morning. We give way too much credit to Satan, way too much. Like, n- no one in the Bible was ever afraid of Satan. Have you ever noticed that? Nobody was afraid of Satan. There you go. Even that's not Satan. That's called... Thank you. So no one, Jesus wasn't afraid of Satan. Eve wasn't afraid. The disciples come back and go, wow, even the demons do what we say. No one's walking around going, I'm in serious spiritual warfare. They're not saying that. So where do we get that from? You know who tells us that Satan is powerful and we should be afraid? Satan. And we go, I know, that's where you're right. Like that's, that's how complicit we are with the enemy because we're not paying attention. Like why do you say the things that you say? That's, that's part, of a, part of holding each other accountable is not checking up on how much each other sinned. That's a, that's a horrible group to be in. Who wants to be in that group? But to just, just, we're calling each other to be who God says we are. Like, let's get together and say, why aren't we being who God calls us? And, and holding you, like, you just, someone, you know, someone talking to me, and I'm just like, do you realize that the last five minutes, everything you've said is false? Like, that's accountability. Like, what you said is actually not true. That's accountability because w- w- the way we know something is true is it leads to freedom. And what's false leads to bondage. God, like, tried to make it really simple, and we keep overcomplicating all this stuff. Like, we keep making it way more difficult than it is. It's like, just relax, relax, and listen, and pay attention, and enjoy, enjoy it. So we were sitting here, and I was just thinking of our team in Jordan that we worked with in Jordan, our team, and I was just envisioning around the room of the different people on that team, and it was... There's, it was just normal, average, common people. Like nobody's super spectacular, none of us. Just people trying to be who God called them to be. And p- as part of that calling, they worked in Jordan. Like it wasn't this huge, we're called to Jordan. It was like that's where their identity and the spirit moved them. They worked for different, we all worked for different companies. And we met together at night and we were just like, well, we're all here. We love the Lord. Let's discover our identities together, which is what we did. And let's go live out those identities in our workplaces. And it started a people movement. That's what happens. It's like it's the organic outflow of a transformed life is transformation in people around you. That's what happens. Like, that's it. Simple like that. So I was just thinking of our team going around in my mind around the room. We had this one girl. <laughs> Um, and when we first met her, she spoke with a British accent. We were like, oh, are you British? No. Huh. Where are you from? Tennessee. Really? But you have a British accent. She says, I know, I do. Was your mom British? No. Your father? No. Anyone British in your family? No, I grew up in a trailer park in Tennessee. And you have a British accent? Yes. You know how people don't answer your question? They just keep, yeah. I do, yeah, I have a British accent. Why do you have a British accent? I didn't like the Tennessee accent. Oh. And she said, I could pick any accent I want to have in the world. I pick British. Like, and they were all like, that's a great idea. Why have we never thought of that? I'm trapped in my accent forever. She said, I'd rather have a British accent. And so her, from, since she was a little kid, she trained herself to have a British accent. And she was a master at languages. This little girl, she graduated number one from the University of Tennessee in engineering. Like, that's, how, that's who she was, but she grew, her dad had died. She grew up with, you know, single mom in this trailer park in Tennessee, and she was this fabulously brilliant engineer who was a master at languages. When do you think she realized she was gifted in languages? When she was a little kid going, I think I'll have a different accent. 
That's her identity coming forward right there. That was it. It wasn't any magic time when someone prayed over her and she got it. She was born with it. Your identity is you're knit together in your mother's womb in that identity. And the journey of your life is to discover it in all of its fullness and beauty. And you're not a victim. That, Evan was never a victim in her life. But she had a lot of reasons to come up with that identity. She, but she didn't. And, and then, you know, when we actually found out who she really, really was, it was even more impressive. Why are you in Jordan? I don't know. But she was there as part of this super strategic thing, but she was alone. She was by herself, and she joined our team. We had a little community. You want to be on our team? I guess. We don't have any other British people from Tennessee on our team. Would you like to be on our team? <laughs> yes, I would like to be on your team. And so she joins our team. Her team just meant we met together. That's what it was. And so there was her, and then there was this couple who were from Alabama and, and Georgia, the couple, who the husband's from Alabama, the wife was from, no, husband's from Georgia, the wife from Alabama. So we have a British speaking person who's absolutely fluent in Arabic. Next to her is this couple, and they talk like this. And we were like, you didn't want that accent, did you, Evan? No, no. That's the one I didn't want. Where are you from? You follow? You follow Georgia? That's a small town in Georgia. You follow? You follow? I thought they were saying, do you follow what we're saying? You follow? Yes. Yes, we do. And Amy, the wife, when we first met her, this is what she said to me, talking to her, and she said, does my eye freak you out? And I said, I mean, I was wondering about her eye, but would I say anything about it? Does my eye freak you out? I'm like, no. Then you, then you lie. You know, you're a liar. No. Because it freaks most people out because my eye goes wherever it wants to go and it freaks people out. <laughs> then I didn't know which eye she was talking about. You know what I mean? I'm like, I didn't know where to look. Oh. This is our team. We're going to lose. I think we're going to lose with this team, you know? It's like, who, who would pick this team? And her husband, <laughs> and her husband, Wes, and Wes... I don't have time to get into all that, but anyway. And so I'm just going around the room, and one, one woman, our single mom on our team who, who, you know, got pregnant when she was in high school and had her, gave her child up for open adoption, and just like these incredible, and then this guy that grew up in a cult group in Washington State, and that was our team. And they were amazing in the kingdom, incredible people. And all Don and I did with them was help them fully understand who they actually already are. That's all we did with them. And the more they discovered it, the more they real. It, it was more like, yeah, I've kind of always known that about myself. Of course, God's never hiding it from you. So, and they worked for different, you know, computer companies in Jordan and the U.S. government and the Jordanian government. And we would just all go to work and then come, we get together at night and talk about wh what's happening with the Muslims that you work with. Like, what are you doing? What kind of ideas are you coming up with to hang out with them? And they would just come up with these ideas. And then we would, and they would just do it. And it was the most fun. And then the Muslims started coming over to hang out with us. And then every other week, we would do a dinner at our place. And we would always have at least 40 Muslims come to be a part of discovering identity and these crazy, weird American team, except the one girl that they thought was British, that team. And it was just so fun. And it was, you know, we had hard times and all that, but it was just overall really fun. We were alive and free in Jordan. That's what we were doing. We weren't, you know, we weren't like strategizing necessarily. It's just like, let's just over, let's just give what we have away. This transformative life, let's just give it away. And it affected people. And so while I was thinking through that, while we were singing in that beautiful music, thank you guys for that, um, and this beautiful, incredible place, I, loved, I just love this whole thing. And then one of the guys that worked with us in Jordan texted me out of the blue. He just all of a sudden texts me. And um, I told Donna, you'll never guess who just texted me. And I tell her, and she's like, you're kidding. And it's this other guy that was on our team. He, and he just came short term, and he, he came out there. And we were, so we, because our team was a lot of fun to be with, people then wanted to come and just hang out there with us, which we loved. 
And um, so they would come, and some would stay with us, and some would stay with other people. And so this one guy wants to come, this guy that texted me, oh, this is a while ago, and we're looking at his, kind of his, like, describing himself, and he, he, he's, he has his name, which is, was a really weird name, and he, he grew up in a commune in Oregon, a goat commune. And we're looking at, yeah, really? I've never, ha- I've never had anyone go, yeah, like New York City, yeah, goat commune, woo! That was funny. You can make a note of that. Never had a. Anyway, and he has this really weird kind of name, and I'm looking at him. I'm like, I'm just thinking, this guy will, like, in the Middle East with Muslims, this guy will never make it here. But then I look at our team and like, well, pretty much anyone can make it here apparently. So, so anyway, he comes. I, I, in my spiritual, uh, said I don't think we should take him. The rest of our team vetoed me. And uh, he came, and so he comes, and he was exactly what I was afraid of. He was this real earthy, out in nature, out East Coast, uptight. You know, Washington, D.C., we're uptight, we're stressed out, we got to get things done. And he's like, it really didn't matter if anything ever got done. And it, he drove me crazy. And his favorite word was, oh. That's what he would do. And he would go, that's awesome. That's his favorite thing. He would go, oh, that's awesome. Even if I was talking about hell, he'd go, oh, that's awesome. Like that. And so, so I'm like, we're, so we're training him like, hey, when, you, when you're like engaging with Muslims, we don't advise that you do. But if you happen to, here's what we do. We taught him the kingdom circles. I was talking about that last night. And so I said to him, look. Do you understand the meaning of this diagram? It's just circles and talking about coming into the kingdom. And I said, do you understand this diagram? And he said, oh. He goes, I love circles. I'm like, (laughs) the the geometric shapes aren't even the point of the diagram. I could use triangles. He's like, oh, I like triangles. You know, it's like, oh, my gosh. And then I said, okay. Just take, can you just take this and go out into the city and just find someone and do this with them? Just sit down and do this with them. He's like, all right, yeah. So he goes out and he decides, he decides, I don't even know how old he was at the time. He, he decides, uh, this is his, his, his prayer with God. He says to God, God, if the person that I talk to or that you want me to talk to recognizes me as an American, I'll know that's the person that you want me to talk to. <laughs> Like, that's a pretty easy one for God, since you don't know Arabic, you only speak English, and you're in a city of no other Americans. So that's probably, so that's his thing. It's like my fleece. Okay. So he goes out into the east part of the city, which is pretty militant, actually, of course. He picks the worst part of the city to go into. And he's just walking around by himself, and, and he sees this older guy sitting out in front of a shop, drinking tea, this old, older Muslim guy, and he walks up to him and he goes, he goes, dude, that's how he starts, dude, can I show you something that's awesome, and the guy goes, are you an American, <laughs> like he knows this is the one, the guy knew right away I was an American, we're like, oh, that's <laughs> stunning, and uh, no one's ever called that guy dude in his life, I promise you, and so he goes, are you American, and yes, all right, and he's all excited, and he sits down next to this guy, older guy, and does the kingdom circles, and the older guy's like, who speaks English, fortunately, he's like, oh my gosh, he goes, that is brilliant, that is brilliant, this whole thing about the kingdom, and Malakut Allah, the Muslims say the kingdom, and how to enter the kingdom, he goes, that's really brilliant, go, continue, continue, keep going, yeah, what, what else is with this, and the guy goes, that's all I got. That's all he knew. He didn't know nothing else other than these circles and that presentation. And then he was, beyond that, I don't have anything else. He just looks at the guy. That's all I got. And the guy's like, do you know any other people that have more than this? And he's like, oh, yes. So he goes, I'll get him. He comes back and he tells us, I met this guy. He knew I was an American right away. Um, I'm sure it was prophetic. I'm like, all right, whatever. And then and he goes, and he tells us who the guy is. And so me and Wes, the guy from Georgia, 
um, who the guy from Georgia could never, and the, and the guy from Oregon could never really have a conversation because they just didn't understand each other. <laughs> like West talks like this. What are you doing, man? What are you doing? What do you, you grew up on a go farm? What is that? What is that? What is that? And, and, and the other guy talks real slow. What? <laughs> it wasn't a goat farm. It was more like a commune. What, you're communist? Like, I don't get this. What is like that? They just could never have a conversation. It was like, you guys don't talk to each other. Like, don't talk to each other. So me and Wes go to meet the guy. <laughs> and Wes is like, I don't know. I don't know what this guy told. I don't know what, what does he tell this Muslim guy. I don't know. It's going to freak him out. And so we get to the Muslim guy. And the Muslim guy, we meet with him. And he's like, who is that young man that you sent out? And we're like, why? Like, he is brilliant. And I look at Wes, and Wes is like, oh, my God. <laughs> he thinks that's one of our best guys. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the old guy's like, that guy was amazing. He, like, he found me. He took the time. He sat down. He shared me this. He didn't know a lot, but what he knew, he shared. And... And so we're like, so we start to talk to the guy, and it turns out that this guy is an Islamic scholar. And he has his own television show with a million viewers. And we're like to God, like, you sent to that guy, this guy, that guy? Like, you sent our worst guy to their best guy. What kind of a God sends your worst person to their best person? Jesus does. Jesus does. And this guy comes to faith because of the other guy. And so we're like, we're not training anybody anymore. We're not going to train them. We're just going like, to go out, and if they think you're American, start talking to them. That's our new training style. So this is a guy that just texted me right now, this kid. And um, so this guy comes to faith, the the. Islamic guy comes to faith, and he goes on his television show and starts sharing the kingdom circles that this guy from the goat commune taught him. It's like the weirdest story. It would be like taking tax collectors and fishermen and prostitutes and trying to win the world with them. It, it's dumb. What kind of a leader would do that? So he texted me right now, today this guy... He's absolutely brilliantly fluent in Arabic. I can't even tell you what country he lives in because he lives so deep in the Muslim world. And he is so powerful. He's married to an Egyptian woman. And he's just, if he walked in here, other than the way he talks, as soon as he talked, you would know that's him. Because he still talks exactly the same. His Arabic is like, yeah, Allah is awesome. You know, that's how kind of how he is. But but he's this, he's this like front line, super impressive, super powerful. He's a fitness trainer. He owns his own company in this Arab country that he's in now that most people can't even get in. He's in there and he owns his own company. It's unbelievable. The beauty of that is he, he, he was key. He was one of the streams in starting what happened in Jordan, this guy. He had only been in the country a couple of months and he started a movement, him, that guy. And it was, I love how the Lord does it. It's like, it's like we need these kinds of people that are just, we'll just hear God and move. And life is simple, and we're just going to live that way. And that's how he lives. Even now, even when he's texting me, I just started laughing. Because um, even his text is like so laid back. It's like, you just have to read his text slow. You know, because it's just like, I'm sure it took him an hour to type this. He calls me brother. Hey, brother. That's what he always calls me. So I'm thinking about him. And that whole thing, and thinking about how many people does it take to start a movement? You know, I was talking about the Samaritan woman last night. Who started the movement among the Samaritans? One, one bad woman started that movement. If you go to, in, into the West Bank today, into Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans live today, when you walk into their museum there, they only have one image of one woman in their history, and it's her it's the bad woman who, on the day that Jesus met her, thought, I'm stuck in my life. I'll never get out of it. This sucks. It'll never change. And now she's immortalized in the history of Samaritans. One day with Jesus, one conversation with Jesus, and all Jesus is saying to her, why are you acting like this bad woman thing? Why are you doing this routine? Be who I made you to be. Be the leader of men. Drink from me, and then from you will flow the rivers of living water. Jesus doesn't have to go with her. Like, you can do it. Go get them. 
So that's how Jesus empowers people. He's with them a short time, and he's like, go get them. Go. Go get them. And, and why don't we, get, we have to have Jesus holding his hand? No, 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 no. Go get them because once you drink from me, your identity is in full gear. Go. And then, so then your highest level of being in communion with God, your highest level, like when are we, what is the highest level of being in communion with God is to be a co-creator with God. That's the highest you can get. It's what Adam and Eve started at. It's like, go out there and discover and create things. Go and enjoy and never get isolated and by yourself. Never do that because once you start thinking to yourself and talking to yourself, you will die. Stay together. Stay interconnected with the earth. Stay interconnected with each other. Stay interconnected with your true self. Stay interconnected with God because this whole reality is built on relationship. And if you step out of relationship, you're going to die. I don't care who you are. You're going to perish. Stay in community. Which means the two greatest commandments would be then to love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love your neighbor in the same way that you love your true self that God made. And that is it. If you get that, go enjoy and be transformed. That's it. That's how simple it is. Who makes it so complicated? Who complicates that? We do. We do. And the enemy loves the complication process. So I was thinking about, I said last night I was going to talk about David, which means I'm not going to talk about David. That's how I know. Lord, I'm thinking about talking about David. He's like, good idea. We're not doing that one. Um, but, but David, I was reading also Psalm 27 while I was sitting here which I think is written at the end of David's life. I think that psalm is at the end of his life because he talks about what seems like the death of his parents. But he's talking about his life, and if you know that very beautiful psalm, it's one of my favorites. He's, he starts out by talking about God as his rock and his salvation, that he's, there's nothing really to be afraid of in life, ever, really, because God is our protector and all that. But then when he gets down to the middle of the, of the poem, he says this, he kind of like sums up the whole thing, and he said, if, there's just, if I could just do one thing, if I could just get one thing, have one thing in this whole eternity, if I could have one thing, this is the one thing I would have. Do you know what he says it is? That I would dwell in the presence of God forever. That's his, that after King and Goliath and all of it, and the ups and downs of his life and all the amazing stuff that we get to read through is like a cautionary tale for us. All of that, he says at the end, it's like, I would just, I would just, I would take it all, I would just to live in the presence of God every day of my life would be all I'd ever want. And he's not talking about being a monk out in the desert. He's talking about in his every day. I just want to walk in the presence of God every day of my life. That would be the goal. And guess what the goal of the Bible is? That is the goal. That's it. Communion with God. That is it. God didn't make you to do stuff for him. He made you to be in communion with him. And whatever comes out of your identity, do it. Great. But it's not like, well, I can't get anything done because these people down there won't do it. God is not like that. He, Paul Young said it. He said, how many of you, if you're a parent, look at your little kid and go, boy, I can't wait till you grow up and become a tool in my hand. We would never say that, about, but that we think that's what God looks at us and goes, wow, you're useless. All you do is want to sit around and talk with me. What a waste of time. It's not. That's what it's all about. Because if you're in the presence of God, this is what David says. He says, in the presence of God, in the presence of God, I would do two things. This is his highest goal in life. I would live in the presence of God every day, and in the presence of God, I would do two things. Number th thing number one that I would do is gaze upon his beauty. That's all he's doing, gazing upon his beauty. What is the value of that? What is the value of, I just want to gaze upon your beauty? Because what he means is in every situation in his life, all of it, looking back, God's beauty was always there and he didn't always see it. Beauty for ashes. And there's times in David's life where David takes his eyes off of God and turns it on his own thinking. And every time it says, and David, and David thought to himself, he's taking his eyes off the beauty of God in the, in the difficult situation he's in, and he's turning it inward and just talking to himself about it. And as soon as he does, 
he leaves his true identity and he starts to formulate a life plan that makes not only him miserable, it makes the men who love him want to kill him. That's how drastically the difference is between inquiring of the Lord and thinking to myself. So dangerous. Once you turn inward and you become your own reference point, you are lost. Because then you have no community. The community is gone. God is gone. Your true self is gone. This relationship with whoever is gone. And I'm just inward and I'm like this. And, and, that's, what, and that's called separation and that is called sin. And God hates, hates, hates separation. He doesn't hate, hate, hate moral failure. He hates, hates, hates separation. And that's what identity and hearing and all that is about. is about reconciliation. We're ministers of reconciliation. That's what we're doing. We're reconciling ourselves to God. We're reconciling to one another. We're reconciling back to the planet, which we've murdered like we're we're supposed to be ministers of reconciliation and jesus is reconciling all things to himself it's kind of a great awesome thing to be a part of we're not trying to convert the nations from the bad team to the good team that's called conflict that produces separation we're like like when we show up in the muslim lord we're here to tell you why you're wrong and we're right and they're like we don't like you already that's called separation that's not helping anybody. We're, it's like we're here to tell you, we're here to help you discover who you really are and in who you really are, the joy and love that just pours out of that. We're here to help you do that. That's different. People like that idea. We're here to help you be relational with yourself, God, and others. That's what we're here for. What's the name of your team? We don't have a team. We're not on a team. Okay. What's your agenda? That you be reconciled to yourself, God, and others. That's it. Do we have to come to your place? No. Do we have to pray your way? No. People are like, okay, I'll listen to that. But man, you go into their place and stand up in their room, and I'm just here to tell you that everything you guys hold sacred, straight from hell. And we're having a Bible study at our house tonight. We'd love for you to come. <laughs> and they come, but they don't come to be your friend. They come to burn your house down because you just insulted everything about who they are. And we call that mission. That's not what that is. God didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to rescue the world, to redeem the world. And it's way more fun. It's way more fun like you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to kill people because you're afraid anymore. You don't have to isolate yourself way over there and hate everyone because you're afraid. You don't have to do that anymore. Be reconciled. Be reconciled to yourself and to God and to others. That's the beauty of it. And so that's what David's saying. I would gaze upon your beauty in every situation that I am. I'm sitting in traffic. I'm stuck in traffic. And just say to God, where's the beauty here? And let him show you the beauty of that. There's, God's beauty is everywhere, even on the cross. When people are murdering Jesus, there is beauty there. And David's like, I want to be able to be in your presence and see the beauty in the darkest places of my life. Wouldn't that be amazing? The God that will never leave you nor forsake you, not there just so you can have a happy time all the time, but even in the darkness, even in the struggle, even when your whole team is killed in Baghdad, and one day, like we arrive, and they killed your whole team. Please identify the bodies. Like, is there beauty in that? Yes. Well, how do we know? Because there was beauty in the cross. That's how we know. Somehow that was love being demonstrated towards us. That brutal, the highest act of brutality humans could come up with. Let's nail Jesus to the cross and humiliate him. And God's like, and that just rescued you. Like, what kind of God is that? He's using our attacks on him to be our rescue. Do you know how safe you are with that kind of God? He won't even abandon you when you're spitting on him. He's like, that spit just worked out to your advantage. That's like, it's incredible. Like, what do you, it's called forgiveness. It's called mercy. It's called grace. Guess when it stops? Never. It never stops. Guess when God gives up on you? Never. That's what I read in this book. The God who speaks. The God who wants you to know who you are, who he made you to be, that God. Why would you not want to be with that? Why would you be afraid of that? So, 
David says, I would gaze upon your beauty. And the second thing he says he would do is I would ask you questions all day long. I would gaze upon your beauty and inquire of you. That's what he says. The goal of my life, if I could do whatever I wanted to, I would be in your presence all day long, gazing upon your beauty and asking you questions. He says, for surely you will answer me. That is a pretty simple life. And what are you supposed to, like doing what vocation? What difference does it make? Do you understand that? What difference does it make if you're living in his presence, gazing upon his beauty and asking him questions? What difference does it make what your job is? What difference does it make what country you live in? If all of us just went to where we love to be in our true self, we'd be spread out all over the world. If we all just did the vocation that our heart really wants to do, we would be doing all vocations. And in all of, we would cover the entire planet in every vocation, living out our true identity with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and we would win the whole world. But we made it too complicated. There's got to be the right vocation. Because God's like, what are you doing in that job? I can't use you in that job. You have to be a salesman or I can't. Like, really? Like, why did you get that job? Oh, no, okay, you're done. Like, what are you doing living there? It's like God turns his back and like, did you move to Ohio? Why? I can't do anything with you in Ohio. Like, that's how we think. God, where do you want me? He's like, how about anywhere? <laughs> like, what job should I get? What do you like doing? How hard do you want to make this thing? How complicated do you want to make it? And Satan's like, you're not living in the right place. You're not living in the right place. You're not living in the right place. Where's the right place? God's not going to tell you. Why? It's complicating. He's, he's like unclear most of the time. And we're like, I know. I believe it. And then the enemy, the Muslims say this, Satan becomes your sincere advisor on all things. Can I hear God simply? Yes. Satan says, no, you can't. No, you can't. And you're like, yeah, I agree with that. Like that, That's, and it gets complicated like that. So I would dwell in his presence all the days of my life. Can you imagine the disciples in the, in, when Jesus is, you know, sending them out into the world? There's no such thing as the Great Commission. That's an invented term. Jesus doesn't go, I'd like to give you the Great Commission now. You could gather around. This is the Great Commission. That's our invented word. It was invented by a Lutheran pastor. And then Hudson Taylor kind of made it famous. Now we all have the Great Commission. That's not in the Bible. Here's what Jesus said. As you guys are going into the world, as you're going into the world, disciple the nations. There's what he says. If any of them would have said, what country? What country should I go to? What do you think Jesus would have said? I said, as you're going into the world, world, not China, the world. Yeah, but what country? I don't know. Where do you want to go? Well, I was just going to go to that shop. Okay, disciple the nations right there at the CVS or wherever it is you're going. Like, as you're going, disciple the nations. Because guess what? Humans are all different, different identities. You'll go everywhere. Just go. Why do you want to make this complicated? And they're like, no, but I don't even know where. Okay, Jerusalem. Yeah, okay, Jerusalem. And Judea. Uh, and Samaria. Uh, and the uttermost parts of the world. Like, that's everywhere. I know. Go. What do you like, mountains or beach? Mountains, go. Beach people, beach. Mountain people, mountain. Go as you're going there. <laughs> disciple. Like how complicated do you want to have this thing be? Here's the goal. Be in my presence. Abide in me. Stay in relationship with me. Listen to me. Stay in re true relationship with the true you. Don't get in this false thing about what I have, what I do, and what people think about me, and I got to compare myself, and I can only hear from God like they hear from God. Like, don't do that. Hear from me the way I talk to you. What is that? We'll learn together. We'll learn together. Don't compare yourself to anyone. Go like that. That's what he's doing. And we're, and we're into this thing like, I could be wrong. I could do the wrong thing. Okay, you're talking to the God that died for his enemies. Not like, I die for everyone except the person that got the wrong job in the wrong state. I can't, I can't do anything with that person. <laughs> right? It sounds funny, but it's like, come on. The Bible is not like what we're making it into. We're doing it because we're afraid. That's why we're afraid. We're afraid about getting it wrong. So we got to put all these conditions and sheets that you have to sign that I believe all this and to make sure I'm right. Like that. So, I, so being here with you, it's like 
I like it because I feel like the attitude in this room is this. Just relax. Enjoy. Listen. Don't be afraid of who you really are. Be who you're afraid of. And tell the truth. God, I am afraid. Like, I feel like I, sh- I, like I have a deep desire to move to Baghdad. But, but, you know, there's a war. You know, you have to tell God what's going on because he doesn't seem to know the current events. But there's a war there. He's like, oh, okay, that changes everything. You know, I wanted you to go there, but there's a war there? Okay, we're not doing that. <laughs> like, but like, in, you know, it's like this, I, we have the, Don and I are like, we have this d- desire, this longing, this urge to go to Baghdad. It's not because, you know, we're going to win Baghdad. You know, it's not like that. It's like, it's just this beautiful in our own true identities. And I'm like, do you think we ought to go to Baghdad? Like, do you have that same sense? Yes. Are you afraid? Yes. But I think it's where we ought to go. It's not noble. It's not sacrificial. It's, it's God didn't wake everyone up in the night and go, move to Baghdad. He didn't do that to everyone. He did it to us. It's an honor. It's a joy. If I'm going to dwell in the presence of the Lord, he's like, I'll be in Baghdad. Love to have you guys with me. <laughs> and do amazing things over there. If you want to stay in North Carolina, that is an exciting place. But uh, I'm going to do, and, and like in our identities, our identities are called forward into that. It's very beautiful. It's an invitation to respond to something God's doing that our identities come alive in. But if we stand up on a stage like, we live in Baghdad because we're super spiritual. And if you were really spiritual, you would live in a hard place that you hate. <laughs> like, where does Jesus say that? How do you know God's will? Do you hate it? Yeah, that's it. There it is. That's his will. Not love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Not that one. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's it. How do you know God's talking to you? It energizes me. I feel joy. It excites me. When, when you think about hearing from God, like we, we went down to the beach, and this probably wasn't a good one by your standards, um, but it, it seemed good to us by our standards. It was like, this is the most amazing beach we've ever seen. We tell people where it was, and like, oh. <laughs> really? And it turned out to just be a fountain at the end of our street. We thought it was the beach. That's how long it's been. I had a waterfall. There's no waterfalls there. Oh, it was an apartment complex. Never mind. But so, so we go down to the, we're, Don and I go down to the beach. And we're just walking around. It's like, um, like, here, like we're looking at these palm trees and the sky and the clouds. And we lay down in the grass, you know. And we're just laying on our backs in the grass. And it's like, if, you, if I say to God, God, say something. He's like, what do you think I'm doing? Did you hear the waves? That is me talking. Did you feel that breeze? That's, what do you want me to say beyond that? Like, do you want to hear me quote a Bible verse to you while you lay in the grass? Like, that would kind of take away from it, I think. I was like, why am I thinking of Romans 8 right now? I was like, just lay in the grass and be alive. Do you know what the spirit of life is? God, be alive, breathe deep. And, and Donna's like, we're in Maui. And I'm like, why are we here? Because somehow God thought this was a great idea. And we're like, what's God's will? That we're laying in the grass in Maui at a semi-decent beach. (laughs) Not even a, he's like, lay there. You don't know. You can't tell the difference. Just lay there. You'll think it's awesome. (laughs) And get a real Hawaiian to lay there, but you. So, but it's like that. It's like, it's so beautiful. Why would you be uptight about it? I got to hear God here. Like, look at that cloud. But Paul, Paul says it in Romans 1. He says, look at creation. Look at that. That is, you can even understand the invisible qualities of God by looking at that. What do you want? What do you want? Because we made this hearing thing into this unique, special, very privileged, special. It's not. God's talking all the time to everyone all the time. Here's the problem. We're afraid. And when you're afraid, you can't hear anything. Anybody talking, trying to communicate with you. So that's, so that's kind of how it is. And when you start to read the Bible, <laughs> when you read the Bible, the Bible is it's inspiring. That's what it says. It's inspiring. It's profitable for correction and reproof and instruction in what is right. That's what it says about itself. And so we, we try and do, make it into other things, but that's what it is. And you're reading the story from Adam and Eve forward, all these different humans, all different ages, all different situations, and it's like a case book of every kind of scenario of humanity. It's not your unique scenario. It can't be. But it's a picture of, like, what happened when this guy 
thought that he needed to think to himself. What happened to him? Like, his own men wanted to kill him. The day before, they thought he was the greatest person on the planet. Today, they want to kill him. What was the change? He moved from inquiring of the Lord to thinking of himself. Huh, God, do I ever just think to myself? How would I know? Are you separate in relationship from people around you? Yes, that's it. There you go. That's how the Bible is talking to us, like that. And, then, and so then I'm looking at Gideon right now, which is just kind of where I want to focus for the next 10 minutes here, is Gideon. I'm thinking a lot about David, but so think of David. All I want to do is dwell in the presence of God every day, gazing upon his beauty and asking him questions. So when I was a police officer, like my question to God was, <laughs> can you talk to me on the job? Can you talk to me in the middle of a domestic dispute? Can you, can you help me think about investigating crime in a way that I just can't come up with on my own? Just those basic questions. Like, if I'm standing here in this scenario and this couple hates each other and they're beating each other up and we've already been here four times this month, can you tell me something to do here that's different than the thing that doesn't work here? Like, is there a way that works? Or we just, it's called compuls compulsive repetition. When you're in a fear loop, you just compulsively keep doing the same thing over and over again. Whole co countries do this. Compulsive repetition. This would, a federal task force is nothing but compulsive repetition. Because no federal task force in the U.S. has ever worked. Ever. Never. So what are we going to do next year? We're going to do another one with more money. Because we don't know what else to do. We're afraid. Instead of saying, God, and this is where believers should just shine. I have another way to think about meth production in the U.S. and how to stop it. You do? Yes. What would you do? And you present a plan that the lost person goes, wow. You don't say a thing that they're going, we don't even know what you just said. Your language is so ch Christian charged, we don't even know what you just meant. You lay out a plan and they go, oh my gosh, that like, that's weird. But actually, that makes sense. That's what a believer can do in connection with the Spirit of God. We hear in the intuitive way up here in symbols and beautiful metaphor, and we hear it. And then we bring it down in the rational and say it so that person knows what in the world you're talking about. That's what we should be doing in the world. Not making them speak our language, but translating so they can get it. And so I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm like... And I realize, wow, there's a lot of evil going on in this domestic dispute. What happens if I just shut down the evil in the room? What would happen? Like I read that, Satan doesn't, Satan doesn't have any authority in this family. And I'm a kingdom, I'm the kingdom of God. The, when you walk in a room, the whole kingdom of God walks in the room. Do you understand that? The, all of it, the whole thing. It's like a pres if the president gets on a Cessna, it's now Air Force One, and the whole military of the United States of America protects that one little Cessna because of who he represents. When you walk into a place, the entire kingdom of God is walking into wherever you go. We don't believe this, but it's actually true. It's like, oh, no, here comes the whole kingdom. Mm. Like you walk in to get chips, and it's like the kingdom of God just arrived to get chips. That person's the entire kingdom. It's the fullness of the Godhead bodily right there. Do you believe that about yourself? No. No. But that's actually what's happening. So I mean, I, so what do you, so here's how you have to try this stuff. So I'm just in there to, you know, 911. But now they're calling the kingdom of God, represented by the police department. So you show up on the scene, there's a domestic dispute. I'm a rookie, just cut loose from my training officer. I'm like, God, can you shut down the evil in this room? He's like, I have been known to do that historically. I read a couple of stories about in the Bible. I don't know if they're true or not. Try it. See if it's true. And so I don't think Satan can read your mind. Personally, that's my thing. I think you have to kind of say it out loud, but I don't want to yell it. They're fighting anyway. They're not paying attention to me. And so I just softly say, with no, no real authority, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> I just command all evil to be silent in this room right now. And the whole place just goes silent. And just the tension in the room just drains out of it. And the people fighting stop. They're like, and they look at me, and I'm like, I, I'm just as shocked as you are. Boy, just, I, I, I don't even believe this stuff. And then I realized that works every time. Like, we actually have authority over evil. 
Why don't we think we do? Because we listen to the enemy tell us whether or not we have authority over evil. Or we just think to ourselves, I probably don't have authority over evil. I probably don't. And the enemy's like, you really don't. And I'm like, okay, we agree. All right, we'll do it. We'll live like that. And so then, then I just like, you know, you try it, and it, it's varying degrees. And, it's just, and then it kind of becomes like pretty am- I hope I get another domestic dispute today. Like, this is pretty amazing. And like, I like my job. But I know I work with cops that hate their job. We're losing. We're losing. Everyone's against us. Those liberal. You know, it's like, and like I don't want to work with these people. I want to work. Th- so, I, so then I get to train rookies, you know, as I practice and get promoted because I can do this kind of stuff. But then you have to tell your sergeant, how did you do that? And your sergeant's like, how did you do that? And I'm like, well, I don't know how to explain it to him. Well, I asked Jesus. And he goes like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> well, and you have to figure out how to say it in a way that he can understand it because he saw what happened. He just doesn't understand how did you do that. And so I have to say it in a way that he can move along and grow and, oh, okay, all right, wow. And then by the fruit they know. So then I get to train rookies, which is really fun because now I, their future is in my hand. And so I'm like, we get a call for a domestic dispute. I said, okay, well, we're going to go to a domestic dispute right now, and I'm going to show you something that you didn't learn in the academy. It's really good if you're going into a domestic dispute, but I need you. And I did what Dave DeCollum does to me. I need you not to say one word. Like, I'm paying back. You're not allowed to talk because you don't know what you're doing. I do. You don't know what you're doing. So you just be quiet, and you just wa- observe. <laughs> Walk into the domestic dispute. I just whisper in name. And you just, the rookie's like, I'm like, yeah. Hmm? We get, and then we, you know, we work the, we work at, you know, as you're supposed to as a police officer. Um, we did a, a, all kinds of interesting stuff in that. And then I would get back in the car, and he's like, "What was that? What did you do?" I'm like, "You know what? Yeah, you, you got to be in the kingdom of God to do that kind of stuff. I mean, if you want to be a police officer in the kingdom and work at this level, you got to be in the kingdom. So, otherwise, I'm just showing you what I can do. Whether you want to do it or not, it's up to you. You have to be in the kingdom." <laughs> What do you think they say? I don't want to be in the kingdom. They're like, I want to be in the kingdom. I want to be in the kingdom. Well, it's kind of a journey. I, I, I want to be in the kingdom. Why? Because being in the kingdom makes you vocationally a better police officer. Like, that's how real it is. It's not magic. It's real. God is real. It works. It works in reality. That's what it is. And so then, so then you know, then everyone wants to be trained by you. But they won't say why. Hey, were you trained by him? Why? Uh, he does this thing. That's all they say. And then in Jordan, what are you doing? We're going to go listen to the new idea. It's too big to explain. How do you explain the kingdom of God and transformational life? It's too hard to put into words. It's just, let's just come and see. Just come and watch. Like that. So in Gideon right here, I'm going to go through this. I'm going to, I have two times to talk about Gideon. Let me read this passage to you. We're trying to break out of compulsive repetition. We're in these patterns in our life that don't work, and we just keep doing them over and over again. We want to break out of this. Breaking out of it is not complicated. So here's Jud- this is Judges chapter 6. I'm gonna, there's like, I think, kind of four, idea, four parts here. Number one, number one thing is, who is the real enemy? That's the number one thing. Who is your actual real enemy? This, the Bible is... Remember when Jesus receives his identity? He's baptized. He comes up out of the water, and he receives his identity from God. That's an identity exchange right there, transformation. This is my son, who I love and whom I'm pleased. He receives his identity in community from God. True identity is always received in community from God. That's true identity. And then the spirit comes, and then he's, he's sent out into faith Satan. So that Jesus will never, ever be confused on who his real enemy is. Because when someone's nailing to your, you to the cross, you tend to think that's your enemy. It is not. It is not. The, Satan's greatest tactic is that you never realize that he's the real enemy and the only enemy. It's not your spouse. It's not your job. It's not the government. It's the liar. That's who it is. The rest of it, we can handle. But the lie kills The deception kills. And so Jesus goes out to confront the enemy driven by the Spirit. Lesson number one, who's the real enemy? In in this chapter, lesson number one, when you see Israel start to like tell the truth, is who is the actual enemy and they don't know. 
They don't know who the real enemy is. They can only point to people that are causing them trouble. That person, that political party, that religious group. We got to get rid of all these so that my life can be okay. That's how we think. And if you know this with Jesus, when he goes out to the enemy, Satan only attacks his identity. That's all the enemy will ever attack in you is your identity. He doesn't care about Jesus dying on the cross. He doesn't care about the vocation of Messiah. He cares about the identity of son. If you're the son, that's how Satan talks to Jesus. He doesn't say, if you're the Messiah, he says, if you're the son. Because if Jesus doesn't move in the son identity, the Messiah thing doesn't work. Like Satan's attacking my job. He doesn't care about your job. He cares about your identity. He wants you out of that identity. Whole goal. If you're the son, why are you hungry? That's what Satan says. If you're the son of the God that loves you, why are you hungry right now? Why are you out in the wilderness hungry from the God who loves you and is pleased in you? That's his question. What kind of son, what kind of identity is that? If you're the son, how come you're poor? How come you're poor, Jesus, if he's pleased with you? Why are you poor? Why are you unemployed? That's how he talks. Because we get our identity from our job and by our bank account. That's how we know God's pleased in us. We have money and good jobs. Not true. And if you think God protects you and loves you, throw yourself off the cliff and let's see what he does. Like just testing that identity. You're not his son. You're not a son. Just be aware of it. Just like, and Jesus learns very quickly what the enemy does. And so when the enemy comes again, Jesus is like, here we go, here we go, here we go. And we know what the enemy's going to do. You're going to come and attack my identity. We know, blah, blah, blah. I'm not doing it. I have this one friend when I'm working with him, when we're doing something, he'll just all of a sudden go, uh-uh. He's, that's him talking to the enemy. He's like, no, 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 we're not doing that. <laughs> like, he's, you learned, how many times are you going to fall for this fake thing, attack on your, how many times are you going to let him do it? You have the option not to do it. Tell the truth. I feel afraid right now. I'm not going down this road. God, where's the fear from? Let's go. Come on. Where is it? I'm submitting to you right now. Where's the fear come from? Boom, boom, boom. Go. That's it. We're done. Let's get on with it. Like that. That's abiding. So here it is. The number one is the real enemy. Your real enemy is deception. Your real enemy is Satan. Deception, the lie. Here it is. This is J Judges 6. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. What they're doing here, you'll see. What they're doing here is not committing moral failure. That's not the evil that they're doing. That's not what they're doing that's wrong. You'll see. We think evil is like, I did this wrong. I broke this law. I did this wrong. By the time you're doing that, the real evil has already occurred. The real evil is believing the lie. That's the, real, that's the beginning. You believe the false? Here we go. Right? So the people of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian, which means that they separated themselves from God. That's what they did. That's the evil. But you'll see why. And when they do, you have the choice. And God's like, all right, I'll be right here. I'll be right here when you decide to quit doing this routine. But um, he's not going to yank you back. It's like, here we go. All right. I'm right here, right beside you, right next to you. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Let me know when you're tired of this. Let me know when you're sick of this fear. Let me know when you're tired of this separation. I'm right here, ready to go. Ready, ready, ready. But he'll, he'll let you go. Because he loves you and love can't manipulate you. Can only let you come. Always inviting. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. Here we go, political. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel because the, the people of Midian made for them. So... And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens that are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So what are the Israelites doing in relation to the attack of the Midianites? What's their strategy? They hide. They hide. The people of God, when they're encountering an enemy, they hide. In other words, it would be like they would build a building over here and get all of their friends to come hide in this building with them and pull all of their kids out of the city and get them to hide in this building with them because the enemy is too strong. And we just keep withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing and building little fortresses that we can hide in. Instead of going back out there with crazy people who are just normal people and taking the place over. We hide. So that's what they're doing. That's their strategy. Here comes the enemy. What shall we do? Let's hide in fear and be mad. 
Let's do that and just blame them. And we're like that. That's what they're doing because that's the scenario that they're in. So the Midianites, they would encamp against them and devour the produce of their land as far as Gaza. So imagine, use this as a metaphor for your own life. So the enemy's prowling about you, and all he wants to do is take everything you have from you. The only way he can do it is you give it to him. That's the only way. From Adam on, that's the only way. I would like to have your identity. Here it is. Thank you very much. Live in the false one. That's it. You gave it to him. Eve did it. Everyone in the Bible does it except Jesus. At one time or another, everyone in the Bible just hands that, their true identity to the enemy, and he takes it away in a lie. And they live in the fear and the guilt and the shame of the false identity. So they would encamp against them, devour their produce of their land as far as Gaza, and no sustenance in Israel, no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, the Midianites. They would come like locusts in number, which is an over-exaggeration and not true. This is the perception of Israel. They're like locusts. They're everywhere. There are probably 11 of them. You know, like they're everywhere. The, it, they're taking it over. They're taking over the country because you keep withdrawing. They don't need, they need four people because you keep hiding. Both they and their camels cannot be counted, so they laid waste to the land as they came. Here's the thing about, if you read through the judges, which are, is a whole incredible thing. Each one of the judges, each one of the each time the enemy comes in the judges, the enemy only takes one part of the culture. So like one enemy comes in and just kills all the blacksmiths. That's all they do is kill all the blacksmiths, and then the Israel can't make any weapons, and they lose. This is what the enemy does. The enemy only needs to take one part of your culture, and he will get the whole thing. So we give parts of our culture away. Like, we don't need them. We don't need the artistic community. We don't need them, those weird people. We don't need them. Let them go. We'll keep solid in the word. And we give away our artistic culture, and our whole culture collapses. Because you have to have the artistic identity of your culture. You have to have every identity of your culture walking in their true identity, or the whole culture dies. That's why Paul's saying, there's hand, and we need all of them. Don't say, we don't need this part because they're weird, or they don't agree with me. We don't need them. That's all the enemy wants. Just give me one piece of your culture. I'll take. Who do you want to give up? Give me just one little lie in your life. Let me have it. We'll pick a little lie. Let me have it. Because when I get that one, I'll take the whole thing. And we're not paying attention, honestly. So that's what they're doing. So how do we resolve this? Here's the process. Number one, truth. Number one, truth comes first. So Israel's in this situation. It says, when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, here we go, this is confession. Finally, they're like, we're sick of this. We hate this. We're unhappy. We're miserable. We're sick of this. We're going to tell the truth. We're calling out to God. Even though we think it's his fault and he abandoned us, we're going to try. So when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet. Here's what he sends. He sends the truth teller. That's who he sends, the truth teller. Because you shall know and experience the truth, and the truth shall set you free. When Jesus comes into the world, what's coming into the world? The truth. The truth is coming into the world because the world is lost in the lie so deeply. The way, the truth, and the life comes into the world. And so here it is in the Old Testament, a picture of it. First comes the truth teller. That's you. You're sitting down in your office, wherever you are, wherever you work. You're sitting down there with your kids, wherever you are. You are the truth teller. Like, should we be prophetic? Yes. Here's prophetic. Tell the truth. That's prophetic. Don't complicate it. Prophets critique and energize. Critique and energize. That's what they do. They critique like, this doesn't work, does it? Does anyone think that this is working? Because if you think this is working, you're a liar. This is not working. Can we all agree this is not working? That's critique. Okay, here's what will work. Energize. Don't just critique. Waste of time. Don't just energize. Waste of time. Critique and energize. This doesn't work. I'm unhappy. You're unhappy. Are we all unhappy? Yes, we're all unhappy. Can we quit pretending that we're happy? Yes. Okay, good. Now let's get happy. Critique and energize. That's what all prophets do. That's why we kill them. Because they critique. And then they energize. And we don't want the critique. Because the critique terrifies us. No, let's just pretend it's good. Let's just pretend it's okay. Let's just pretend it's okay. We love living in these caves. We've really grown to love the dark cave. Like, that's how we get. We plant our crops. They steal them. We're used to it. It's okay. When the prophet Israel, so they could cry out to the Lord, the Lord sent to them a prophet. Here's what he says to them. And he said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, 
I, God, I'm remi- God's reminding him of the truth. I led you up from Egypt. Who brought you out of slavery? Because they're like, this is God's fault. Wait, first of all, who brought you out of slavery? Before you start saying I'm leading you into slavery, who brought you out of slavery? I brought you out of slavery, out of the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you the land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Here's here's where the the separation occurs. Here's where they separated or sinned in this statement. God said to him, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites. It's, it has nothing to do with the Midianites. You don't even know who the real enemy is. And the enemy isn't a people. It's your fear of some other god that you think is stronger than me. That's what's killing you. It's like, is it the Midianites? No, it's not them. They're just taking advantage of your fear. Is it the Amorites? No. What is it? It's your fear of their gods. Like you think they're stronger than anything you have. You think you're stronger, they're stronger than I am. Um, and I told you, you shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not, and here's the word, shamad. You did not shama me. In English we say obey, but in Hebrew it's listen. You did not hear what I said. You stopped listening to the voice of God. And because you don't listen to me, you listen to them, and now you're afraid of their gods. What's killing us? Our fear of other gods. We don't have enough money. That God? People, I'm not as good as I'm supposed to be. That false God? What is that? That I'm not the kind of person I'm supposed to be? What God is saying that? That is some other God, and you're more afraid of that God than you ever listen to the real God that's never been disappointed in you, not one day of your life, even when you were his enemy. Never disappointed in you. Never. Never like, boy, I'm really, you're really letting me down today. Never would say that. Never. When did, God, when did you love me, Lord? Oh, every day. When were you proud of me? Every single day. Even when I was way over there, yes. Who told you that I wasn't proud of you? Some person, some religion, somebody that I'm not as good as. That fear gives the enemy complete control in your life. That fear. How do we get out of that? Truth tell. Truth tell. It's your fear that's killing you. That's why the number one exhortation in scripture is do not be afraid. More than any other, any other exhortation, do not be afraid because your fear will kill you. And then step two, and I'll stop here. Step two, the truth comes, and the truth, so watch this. The truth teller comes. This is the, imagine you're sharing your faith with someone, and all you're doing is truth telling with them. It's like, how do you, like you, how do you feel? I, I'm, I'm super stressed out all the time. Okay, Wh- do you know where that's, what do you call that stress? Fear. It's fear. Do you remember when you're, the first time in your life you started becoming afraid of everything? Do you remember when that was? That's what you're doing. That's how we're helping people. Do you remember when that was? Because you weren't born afraid. You learned to be afraid. Do you remember when you first started to believe that lie that you need to be afraid? When did you first learn that? And you're like, let's energize. Let's get out of that. You're the prophet. You're the truth teller. You start to tell. And, and as soon as they start to turn towards the truth, the truth is a person. It's not an abstract idea. The truth is a person. And so look what happens. The prophet comes. He said, but you have not listened to my voice. Listen to the voice of God. And so they turn to listen to the voice of God. And here comes the voice of God. The next verse. Now the angel of the Lord came. Do you know who the angel of the Lord is in the Old Testament? Jesus. The truth teller comes, tells the truth. People start thinking in truth. Hmm. Yeah, we are afraid of them. Why are we afraid of them? And who comes to tell you what, how to think about that? Jesus. There he is. And what does Jesus come to talk about? Identity. Here's what he says. The angel of the Lord came and sat under the tree. 
which belonged to Joas, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So, okay, we're, as a nation, we're going to start telling the truth. We're going to tell the truth. We're afraid. We're afraid of other gods. We don't think God is strong anymore. We don't think he can stop human trafficking. We don't think he can stop crime. We don't think he can really do anything. So we're just going to hide and hope the rapture happens and not be left behind. That's all. That's our whole strategy. That's it. We can't live in the present anymore. We've got to live in some kind of weird future like that. And so they turn to the Lord. No, we're not going to believe that anymore. No, we're going to live in the present. We're going to be open-minded in the present. We're going to expect God. We're going to trust God. Okay, God, what do you want to do? And here comes Jesus to talk about your identity. How many people does Jesus have to come talk to identity about to win the whole country? One person. Do you know why? Because the champion of the country is hiding in a cave. The one person to activate this whole thing is hiding in a cave in a false identity. Satan doesn't have to get the whole place. He has to get Gideon off the scene. He's like, your life doesn't matter. We don't care about you. You're unimportant. Just go live in a cave. And it's the main guy. You, can, you are the main person, whoever you are. And you hiding in a cave makes a difference. And so the angel of the Lord sat under the tree. Gideon's there being a coward, which he's not, but he thinks he is. And while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, this is called hearing from God. This is it. Look how complicated this is. Gideon's not even asking. Isn't that amazing? Do you think you have to ask God to talk to you to get him to talk to you? No. He's been talking to you the whole time. You're just not listening to him. We're not paying attention. He's not talking the way you think he should or something. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you. Really? When? The whole time. You've been with me the whole time. Yep. Well, how come I didn't know that? You didn't look. Not paying attention. Letting the enemy tell you what's going on in your life. You're not paying attention. The Lord is with you, O oh, mighty man of valor. Here's, okay, and I'm just, I'm going to stop right here. Here's two things. When the Lord comes, when Jesus comes to you, and some of you, we've done this together, the things that God will say to you are the things that you don't believe at the deepest level. So here, listen to the two things that the angel of the Lord says to Gideon. The Lord is with you. That is one thing that Gideon absolutely does not think is true. And the second thing is, you're a mighty man of valor. Those are two things that Gideon does not believe at all. So when the Lord, when you're listening to God, and my, I don't know, my sense is that, like, love. That means that what you believe about God is he doesn't love you. God will always speak to you at your deepest doubt or unbelief. That's how great he is. That's how, that's, and so the two things he has, Gideon has to understand is the Lord has always been with you. And you, your identity, is you are a mighty man of valor. When? You've always been. You've always been this, and I have always been. Who told you I wasn't with you, and who said you were a coward? Who told you that? And that's exactly what God is asking Adam and Eve in the garden. Who told you this? I didn't say any of this. Who told you this? Who told you how to hear from God? You want to know how to hear from me? You ask me how to hear from me, and I will tell you how you and I are going to communicate together. Don't ask somebody else like that, mighty man of valor. So as we're thinking through today in our lives, to change this whole thing takes one person. I keep saying, you read through the Bible, it's, it's not God going, I need like, I need a million people right now. He never says this stuff. Like, can we fill a stadium? Because if we can't fill a stadium, this thing ain't going to go. What do you have, a guy from a goat commune and a girl with a weird eye and a British person from Tennessee? That ain't going to work. <laughs> How many Instagram hits is that going to, that's not going to sell. That'll only win an entire Arab city, that little group. That's who you guys are. You, you have no idea who you are. And even when you start to get a taste of who you actually are, it's only a taste of who you really are. And we want to know, who, God, I want to know who I am. This, Lord, I'm gonna, Lord, let's pray right now. Lord, Lord this, is, this is our desire today. From whatever place we're coming from of not knowing you, not getting you, deep in with you, whatever the range we're in, this is what we really, really, really want, to just dwell in your presence. 
like all the time. Like that's it. We want to abide in you and your word to abide in me. And then we can ask whatever it is and it'll be done. We want to dwell in your presence, Lord. We want to just see beauty in everything that we're going through in our life. Even this tragedy, we want to see the beauty. Show me the beauty. And we want to ask you questions for surely you will answer us, Lord. Move us in this. Three people in this room, five, all of us, Lord, we, we would love to receive from you Maui. We want it, Lord. We would be happy to receive that from you, that you would give it to us. And onward, as, the, as we think prophetically about the future. But we must, must, must tell the truth, and we must, must, must meet the truth himself, Jesus, so that we only hear who we really are all the time. Lord, guide us in this, in Jesus' name, amen.